I'm professor at UC San Diego and director of CREATE, where Kim uh, and the San Diego Area Writing Project also lives, uh, work lives, that is. Um, and we have been thinking together about um, smart tech use for equity for a number of years now. At the end of this set of slides, Angela uh, will be sharing uh, an article from now titled Learning for Justice Magazine, where we uh, talk through this model designed with a number of educators in the San Diego area a number of years ago in an era, as Kim said, uh, pre-pandemic, and when it was really about um, a lot of educators feeling like uh, tech was sort of thrown in their in their faces and all bells and whistles that must be good. And we wanted to have a more critical uh, take on the pros and cons of tech use with equity goals in front. And this uh, pandemic moment was a moment where this need for thinking hard about equity oriented tech use was really kind of in everybody's face. And what we wanted to try to do was take um, this opportunity with a number of educators uh, from our network to think hard about um, these kinds of questions. What have we learned about equity oriented tech use that as we head into um, face to face classrooms, we want to take back, but these bigger ahas about equity and teaching really being in front and that's been core to this smart tech use for equity model from the beginning. Uh, we're not really trying to make sure that everybody learns how to use Pear Deck or, or Tech Tool X. We're asking an equity question with an equity goal in front and getting in the habit, which uh, I think lots of folks would argue is crucial to equity effort of any kind, getting in the habit of this constant pro-con analysis, asking big questions about the impact on students of what we are doing. So Denise is our presenter for today and tackling this uh, crucial equity question of sparking and inviting student voice. And we are thrilled to turn the mic over to her and we'll be engaging um, with everybody here throughout. And we will be with this recording also trying to find our, our best nuggets to lift out um, in a future kind of top ahas reel for folks. So welcome and thrilled to, to learn alongside you, Denise, today. Thank you for introducing me. Let me um, go ahead and get set up. Give me one second. Okay. I am using a double screen. So if it looks like I'm not looking at you, I'm trying to. <laughs> okay, so thanks for joining me today. Um, I'll be talking about sparking student voice through digital storytelling. Um, I do have a, an Adobe Spark page where this um, presentation will be housed alongside the resources, the project, some of the student work that I have permission to share, as well as some other references. So that's all there for you to keep and to use on your own. The presentation is not there yet, but I will add that um, once we finish here today. It's really hard for me to present without not without knowing who's in the room. So if we can just take one moment and just in the chat, if you could please just put in your name um, and your educational setting um, or, or your teaching background or whatever you would like, just to give me a little hint of who is here, even if it's just a couple, a sentence or two. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for jumping off. That just helps me know who's here. Welcome, Katie, Tibbs, Brian, I think you've been here. Good to see you. Micah, thanks for joining in the chat. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Independent piano teacher. Okay. Thank you very much. Keep those rolling in. Welcome, Katie Bell. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and get started um, with talking about digital storytelling. So my story begins with a 26 day journey by boat from the Philippine Islands through Guam and Hawaii to Angel Island. So in this photo is my grandmother with her two children, my mom and uncle. And this was about midway through their journey to the United States um, during an emergency drill that they had several of. Um, she told me that my mom and uncle loved these drills. I got super excited. They get to put on the life jackets and run around the boat and go out on the deck. Um, and you can see there that she's smiling, but she's actually terrified. Um, and I heard the story many times throughout her life. So fast forward many, many decades later, and here we are now. Um, so I'm a professor who teaches students who have also landed here after embarking on their own brave journeys from their home countries. And if you look closely at this photo in the back, you can see May. 
Um, that's actually May 2020. Um, so that was a few months into teaching fully remote during the pandemic. You can actually see on my laptop my I love to teach online sticker because I'm an experienced online teacher um, and I love teaching online. However, no matter what our experiences were before the pandemic, it tried all of us and it was a chaotic, difficult time to jump into um, fully remote. So even um, with my experience, this was an extremely challenging time. You can also see my coworker, that's my Jack Russell Terrier, Bella. I'm letting you know she's there because she's right here and you're probably going to hear her at some point. So apologies in advance <laughs> for her. <clears throat> so I teach at Miramar College. Um, and this is obviously taken pre-pandemic. This was spring 2020. So the last full class that I had completely face-to-face. -face. Um, community colleges are the most inclusive of higher education spaces. We accept the top 100% of students. We have um, and welcome first-generation college students from all backgrounds, many who are new not just to college, but our country. Um, the ESL population in our college where I teach ESL as well as English, um, they are extremely diverse. You can just see from this photo of one class, we have all different backgrounds represented. Um, and if you look closely at this photo, whoops, I just moved my thing. Um, they are standing so close together, right? Um, but not only that, you can sense their their community and you can sense how close they are. They know each other's stories after being together for that entire semester. Sorry about the movement there. You can see some of them are holding each other's arms. They're wrapped around each other. The community was formed. So the question as I was moving forward is how do we retain this connection? And then as we moved into fall 2020, starting out cold, how do we begin cold, completely cold online, but still end up with this feeling because it's just echoing through the image, the sense of community and the feeling that they have a shared identity. Um, so there's kind of three main foundations that support me with my thoughts on this. So the first one is from Micah's guidebook on bringing equity to schools. And the chapter that's most important to me in my work with really diverse students is chapter four, which is called um, Culture Talk. Um, and in this chapter, we really, or Micah really dives into this idea of informed and respectful understanding of real people's complex experiences. How do we get beyond that shallow, hey, um, I'm from the Philippines, into a deeper understanding of our identity? Um, how do we invite that? And how do we, as Micah said, become you know, critical um, anthropologists as we explore this. So that's one thing that always grounds me when trying to ask students to invite themselves into a space. Um, secondly is the research that is very much um, on first generation students at community colleges, um, students of color, which is that students need a sense of welcoming and belongingness before anything else. It doesn't matter what the content is or the pedagogy until the relationships are established, nothing else matters. And then finally, in terms of online instruction, so I have been heavily influenced by Dr. Michelle Pakansky Brock's work on humanized online teaching. This prior again prioritizes relationships. Um, and these are all woven together, the four pieces of empathy, awareness, presence, and trust. So all of these kind of coalesce into my normal teaching situation, what was normal. And the question is, how does this uh, transition to the remote environment? And then how does it transition back? Because we want to bring everything that we've learned over the past 18 months into um, our new teaching environment. Um, so with all of those foundations in mind, I had this very lofty grand equity vision, which was um, a vibrant online community where students feel connection and belongingness, where they can share and be their full selves. So not trying to fit in because that forces students and people to adapt, but in instead to belong, to be their true selves without having to adapt or assimilate in any way. So this is a hugely lofty goal, obviously. Um, so trying to ground that into um, uh, an equity question that can be kind of dissected and worked on. So a smaller version here, how can I invite and encourage students to tell their stories and share their full identities, knowing that when we begin with this, then we can move forward um, into those greater goals of why our students are at these community colleges that I teach. 
Um, the urgency was really, really clear during the pandemic. So I had taught online for some time before. So I was experienced, but I was teaching students who had selected online classes, who had the capacity for it, who had the technology for it, who um, identified those as ways that supported their educational goals. So when we went online fully remote in April, uh, or I'm sorry, in March of 2020, suddenly students who had not selected online had no choice. Um, and then followed by fall of 2020, where everything was online from the beginning, again, not self-selected, um, but everyone. So this urgency was this need for community and connection to be forged and sustained in a fully online asynchronous class. And I'm pointing out asynchronous uh, because I'm coming from the community college um, sector and I know at least because I have kids in um, in high school and I have nieces and nephews in elementary school there's a lot of synchronous learning um, in zoom um, and other live sessions available but my classes were intentionally asynchronous so that's again a, a really difficult and challenging um, distinction because if you ask people about online teaching they will most often talk about zoom um, and that was not the situation in my classes so the urgent need for creating this, um, this community, faculty complaining, like we can't see students, we don't know who's there. Students feeling isolated, clicking into a class and having no idea who else is in this black dark room with them, right? Um, you can't just blast into verb tenses. Like I can't just say, we're gonna work on thesis statements. I can't, you know, the biology te teacher can't just start doing labs. We've got to figure out how to invite students in and then build the community first. So that was extremely urgent for me. So enter digital storytelling. So I had done digital storytelling again for, for some time before this, but I had done it as like an add-on, like let's do a little digital storytelling project. And I had lots of in-person support. So I had um, classes where we would go to the lab or we'd bring in the lab carts with the computer carts. Um, and it was just like this fun side thing or in the online classes that I did it previously, Again, those students had self-selected and identified that they were technologically savvy and ready for online classes. So there wasn't much of a need for tech support. Um, so this was a totally different environment to be doing this. I also now was hoping that digital storytelling would be the glue and the connective tissue towards establishing these connections. So it was not just this one-off fun thing for students to do. Um, I actually did kind of a mashup. Um, I used the Pixar story spine um, mashed together with Adobe Spark video. And these two things came together um, to create, uh, to allow students to create um, a chance to tell their full stories. <clears throat> so if you don't know, um, Khan Academy has this great um, Pixar in a box um, module and they've recorded and they have all these sessions with um, Pixar um, writers, movie writers. Um, and then they kind of teach the art of storytelling from a Pixar perspective. And that really was exciting to me because students that are learning a language need a frame to write the story, to be invited into a space where they feel comfortable to use the grammar and the language that's available to them. Um, so this is actually the Pixar story spine. And if you go to their Khan Academy site, they actually break down any Pixar movie to these like eight lines. So it's really interesting. And it is simply this, once upon a time, every day until one day, because of that, because of that, because of that, until finally, and ever since then. So all the students were working with the story frame. And what I did was the line that said, until finally, um, the students all have the same line. So their line was, until finally, uh, I arrived here at Miramar College. So I kind of shrunk the story of their lives, um, not beginning with their 26 day boat journey, but to like, how did you come to be here at Miramar College. So helping them um, choose a story to tell, kind of narrowing it down, but allowing choice in how much to reveal about themselves. So an invitation. Um, so when I did this just with writing, these are the kinds of stories that I would get. And they were already amazing and wonderful and powerful. So again, these are English language learners. So you'll see um, grammar um, errors due to language learning. So here's one, my aviation story. Every day since I traveled by airplane for the very first time, I was admired how the airplane works until one day I realized that I'm interested in airplanes, engines and how it's made. Because of that, I bought many flying simulator programs to understand more about airplanes. 
because of that, I found that the only way to work in the aviation industry is education. Until finally, I started taking classes at Miramar College. And ever since then, I'm trying to do my best in school to accomplish my goal. So the story frame is clear. He has been invited. He's decided to um, share uh, kind of the story of his major, really, right? We have an image that complements aviation, but it's not really sharing so much about his personal identity. So dipping a toe into it. Here's another example. I'm not going to read it, um, but you can see here's a student who felt more vulnerable, shared a photo of her extended family from home. In her story spine, She's talking about the vulnerability of being sad to leave and start over and then the hope of coming to a new class and the feeling of connection she had in her in-person class. So these were shared on discussion boards. Students could comment with each other. Um, there was a robust discussion and there was um, definitely interesting and provocative sharing of personal identities through the, the writing pieces. Um, but then I decided to use Adobe Spark Video to have these move into a digital storytelling piece. So as we usually want with, with technology, it's not about the tool, like it's not like go try Adobe Spark video, it's just the bridge, the bridge to the end of what you're doing. So the idea is how do I have students share a deeper story with their voices, with multimedia um, that creates a stronger connection? The bridge to that for me was Adobe Spark Video. There's a billion different tools that you could use. I chose this for many reasons. One, Adobe Spark Video is um, free. Um, it's a mobile app. Unlike um, some, of, at least uh, unlike some of the K-12 schools, I know they were able to issue tablets to students or kind of had um, a structured um, setup of what technology was being used. Community college students just use whatever they have. So there was no like everyone has an iPad or everyone has you know a Chromebook. It was like people just have what they had. Um, and we know from research that most or many community college students are using their phones. Um, so I really don't use any technology that does not have a mobile app. Um, it's very intuitive. It also saves to the Adobe Spark Cloud. So there's no like downloading, there's no saving, there's no attaching, there's no emailing. It's just all right there. Um, and then recording was easy. So when asking students to do something vulnerable, like share their voice and record it, you don't want technology to be a barrier to that. You want that recording to be easy because there's already so much stress built up with having to make the recording. Um, so here's kind of the overall steps towards making this magical digital storytelling help um, begin. I never started out by telling them we're doing a technology project. Like I did not make some grand, annou grand announcement, like we're now going to make a technology digital storyteller, you know, story, digital story. Um, we're not doing that. We started with the writing. Uh, we practiced the language skills. Um, four tenses, punctuation, and word choice. Then we worked on pronunciation. Um, and then after we wrote and, and you know, worked on language, then we talked about like, well, what images would support and complement your sentences? They don't have to be personal images. Again, with choice, maybe you don't wanna like show your baby picture. Maybe you wanna have some other image that, um, that would represent that, right? Um, and then after that, oh, now we're gonna record your sentences. So you're gonna practice, how can you say this? Do you know how to say all the words correctly? Oh, we're gonna add music. How is music going to add to the overall experience of the viewer? So just kind of step-by-step step moving into that. Um, along the way, I made my own. So I never ask students to do anything that I am not going to do first. And if I'm asking students to be vulnerable and share their identity, just as I began my presentation here today with, with my family history, I have to share my history. How will they ever feel that it's a safe or brave space to share with each other if I don't share first. So that's a picture of me. Um, and I'm, it's just a screenshot of Adobe Spark video because I just wanted to show you how simple it is. You see that big red button, that's the record button. Literally you push it and that's it. You cannot edit it, you can't trim it, you can't make it louder, you can't add anything else. There are zero bells and whistles. If you don't like it, you record it again, that's it. And that's perfect um, for a first dose you know, dipping your toe into something for, with technology with students. Um, on the right, you can kind of see on the screenshot, you just have four different things you can do on a slide. That's it. Full screen, split screen, caption. That's all you really got. So limiting the bells and whistles was really important to me. And that's another reason why I really liked this tool. Um, on the Adobe Spark page that I had, I had many different examples for you all to look at, keeping an eye on the clock here. Um, but I'm just going to share one 
Um, so you can go and look at mine. I'm not going <laughs> to play mine, but I did. This is the one that I shared first, again, um, as a model for students, um, as an entryway and an invitation for them to share their full stories. I always start with mine. So here's um, one student, um, and let me just play it. My name is Thang, and this is my story. Every day, I felt happy to be born and grow up in Hanoi, a beautiful city of Vietnam. I even planned to stay there for the rest of my life, like my parents. Until one day, I fell in love with a guy at college, and we got married. Because of that, when he got a job offer by UCSD, I decided to follow my heart and move with him to the States, where our little angel was born. Because of that, I had to stay at home to take care of the baby full time. Because of that, what I did all day was just housework and baby stuff. So I lost all the English and the working skills which I once had. Until finally, I started taking classes at Miramar College. And ever since then, I have been trying my best to improve my English, broaden my knowledge, so that one day I will become a scientist to fight disease and save lives. So for me, um, looking at that, the text of the story spine compared to the fuller digital um, story is dramatic. It's dramatic in terms of the full identity that students are able to share and the magic of hearing a student's voice really makes a difference. Um, this is another story about love, actually. It's funny how a lot of the um, digital photo stories start to become about love, but he is a singer. And anyway, he learned to sing in English in this band because he fell in love with an American girl. <laughs> okay, so what happened next? So another thing with, um, with student work is that we never wanted to be a one-way street. So the students did not just share their stories with me, um, they shared on a Padlet. So, um, you can see on this Padlet, it goes all the way down. The stories embed very easily into a Padlet. No one has to link out. No one has to open an attachment. It's housed right there. The comments are all, are all also right there. Another important thing in terms of using technology as a bridge is that students had already done Padlet at that point. So this was not another technology hurdle. So it wasn't like, oh my God, I just finished this tech thing. Now I gotta learn another new tech thing just to share it. it first of all, Padlet doesn't need a sign in, so that's helpful. Um, but in terms of this, they had used it before so that, so that they, know, they knew what they were doing. I know you can't see these comments right here, um, but what was interesting for me in terms of the comments that happened here um, is that connections were being formed in ways that I don't think would normally happen in the classroom because there isn't that time and space to share the full story. So under Ludmilla's story, someone had commented they were from the same hometown um, back home. And like both of, the, of these students had been in the US and San Diego for some time and made that deeper connection. Um, what I thought so, was so interesting is that the two main types of comments that people had overall were thanking each other. So just thanking you, thank you so much for sharing your story, whether the student knew where that student was coming from or what they had been through or whatever the story was. Um, and then the second thing was offering encouragement. So students were giving that encouragement to each other to follow their goals, to get support. People were sharing links to things if someone mentioned it. Um, I also loved that students' stories were all really, really different. So you might think like there's a story spine, they're all gonna be the same, they're not. Um, there was one student who uh, just was a very kind of quiet student, went about her work very kind of no nonsense. And then she had this crazy story. She was a Kung Fu master. And in her story, she has videos of her like leaping across and she's got medals and she's training people. and like where it's very hard for that to come up in a classroom, right? Um, online um, or face-to-face. -face. Um, and then there was, an, and students don't have to share themselves, right? So there was this amazing story um, where a student did the whole story. It was about their dog. 
but we learn so much about the dog. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, we learn so much about the student through the story of her dog. Um, and so just all the creation that was able to happen through these stories was really wonderful. Okay, so now let's be really critical and reflective about the barriers. So the barriers were all technology related general technology issues. So students had laggy Wi-Fi, so they were having trouble with that. Um, Adobe Spark has three different things that you can download the app. There's the page, there's the post, there's a video. So students would download the post and they couldn't figure out why can't I record something? It's because you don't have Adobe Spark video. Um, there's always trouble signing in. So students struggled with accounts um, and signing in, um, signing in and then forgetting the password, all of those kinds of things. Smaller issues like, well, I'm not sure how to add images. So if you saw Anton's story, she actually had multiple images on one slide. She created collages, but uh, because Adobe Spark video is made to be very streamlined, you can actually only upload one thing. So then it's like, wait, how did she get six photos. Well, she created a collage, you know, on a photo app and then saved that as one file and then uploaded that. So like, so little things like that. Um, Adobe Spark video, sometimes you have to like turn down the music. So the music's not so loud. So all of these little barriers seem like small things, but what happens if each of these happens to a student along the way? Like that is a very huge barrier. Like I couldn't sign in. Now I signed in, I have the wrong app. Now I have the right app, but my Wi-Fi is not working. Now I have the right app and my Wi-Fi is working, but I can't get the right picture. Now I recorded my voice, but I can't hear my voice because the music's so loud. So all of these barriers really add up and there's something to consider when we're thinking about this from an equity perspective. Um, so support along the way, one-on-one um, -on -one meetings. So lots of emailing back and forth, lots of um, uh, Zoom meetings with students um, as, as needed. Uh, but the two main things that really happened were I had to build a video of um, how to do these things. Um, and they were all like a minute or less, but here's the thing I learned. All of these videos are already there on Adobe Spark video. So I started out by sending them the link. Here's the link to how to add a photo. Here's the link to turn down the music. And it would just always come back. I don't get it or I don't understand it. Can you help me? So then I would make the video, the same video, but it's me with my story saying, here's the music, turn it down. And then suddenly it's fine. So having personalized videos from the instructor turned out to be extremely important, but then I only did it once. So once I did it, then I could use that for future students. Um, and then I learned along the way that students were troubleshooting with each other. So they would get on and say like, oh yeah, you know, um, you know, um, so me and Jung and I, we were up all night, you know, on the phone, figuring this all out together. Um, so we spend so much time in online classes trying to build the student student interaction for them when the truth is, they're just doing it. They've already like called each other and figured it out. And like, it's just annoying that there's now a discussion board to talk about it when they already talked about it offline on their own. But I was really um, interested to see that that student student troubleshooting was happening offline. So many successes, I feel. Um, and I'm going to just point out these four main ones. Voice. Every single student created one. So I did not have a student that, that did not successfully post a story. Every student's story was told, every student's voice was heard. Um, we didn't have, you know, a few students dominating the room or you don't even really know who posted first, right? You know how Padlet is, it just kind of shows up as an array. So, you know, if you're doing this in a classroom, someone's raising their hand, someone's first. We don't know who's first, right? Um, the time was really important. They did this at their own pace. They were not in the classroom for an hour and a half or on Zoom for 40 minutes, like fix your story, write your story, share your story, what, share with your peer quickly. Like they have the space to do it on their own. And then for language learners, they have the time and space to record it as many times as they wanted to until they were satisfied. Um, they had the choice to share with the community what they wanted to share. Um, and people went from sharing very personal images to just using like the, the logos or the icons that were available to them um, on, on Adobe Spark. Um, and then in terms of the language skills, all the language skills were practiced. So they read, they wrote, they practiced grammar, they increased their vocabulary, they did pronunciation, they listened to authentic listening because they listened to all of their stories. Um, and so just a little snapshot. So just from one class, just this one project. So we had 28 digital photo stories, 104 responses, um, all over the Padlet. And then I don't even know how many commonalities were uncovered, right, through these shared stories. Um, but so, yes, 
lovely technology project. It's really working, but we really want to dive into in this series, as Micah keeps pointing out to all of us, is the equity findings. So, you know, does the technology allow all of the learners to share and communicate? Does it empower all of our learners to recognize their, their knowledge and their contributions? So a couple main um, equity findings for me was that I do believe that digital storytelling can be a powerful way for students to share their identities, make connections and build community. And this is through things that can only happen through the magic of multimedia and technology, the magic of hearing someone's voice, the power of music, the personalization of images. All of that is really available only through the technology. Um, the barrier that I was worried about, which was asynchronous learning, actually turned out to be a benefit because it gave students the time and space in the online setting for intentionally thoughtful stories. I'm thinking back to face-to-face -face classes where you're like, turn to your partner, introduce yourself, or get in a group and tell your background. It's on the fly, it's quick, it's difficult for students who are introverted or who don't have the language at the time, but this time and space of the asynchronous session, let every voice shine because it didn't matter how long it took them to do it. Um, and then the last thing in terms of um, tech equity for me is that it empowers students to create and share and publish. So we're moving way, way beyond students consuming technology to get information or to practice a skill, but instead to be creators of their own accord, uh, which is a very much important skill during our time. Um, and then the class connection was formed. If you think back to that first picture of my class standing super close together face to face, I sense that same feeling of my students online, very close together, um, understanding each other's identity and forging a real community. And I do think that technology is best when it brings us together. So what next? Um, I'm still actually 100% online right now. The San Diego Community College District um, went like with 20 something percent on campus and the rest online for fall. Um, and they they uh, prioritize like labs and hands-on classes. So classes like English and ESOL, um, I'm still online. Um, spring is up in the air, hybrid, more um, on campus, some online, we're really not sure yet. Um, but here's the things I'm thinking of as I go back to whatever our new um, situation is, um, is holding that time and space outside of class to build the community. I do think that having, in, having this incorporation of the out of class digital storytelling element will only feed into and supplement and support and build the in-class community. So I would still be doing this and putting a higher priority to, priority to it in, in class than I had in the past. Um, I would provide further opportunities for deeper stories. So this was, usually I've just done it with one story and then we just kind of move on. But here's the thing, they learn the tech. So let's do the next content Maybe instead of the essay, maybe when we do the reflection, like use the tech because now there is no question how to use it and to focus more deeply on the stories that can be told. And then the last thing for me is really important. So our ESOL students, our first gen students, they are very marginalized on our campuses. They are invisible. So until we have a sense of belonging and welcome, you know, welcomeness for all of those students, it's very difficult for them to be part of a campus community. So I really wanna share these stories uh, with my department, with the college community, this, this message that all of our students belong and letting other faculty who have no idea um, the wonderful, amazing stories and identities of my students. Because what I normally just hear is like, oh, their papers are bad, or I can't understand them, right? So letting everyone know the deeper stories of my students. So my story, my story then starts and ends with family. So these photos are from smaller, much smaller journeys this past month, post COVID to visit my family in San Francisco and my husband's family in Chicago. Um, this face-to-face -face connection that we finally had had been sustained during the pandemic um, with the magic of technology and FaceTime. Thank you so much for listening to my story today. And I want to take a moment to just think and breathe. Um, so we're gonna take two minutes. Do we have two minutes? Yes, we'll take two minutes of silence just to sit 
with what you've heard into process. I'll be quiet in just a moment. I'm going to leave these two slides up to think about, you know, what what does all of this um, make you think about with regard to student voice and full identities and using technology in a smart and equitable way. So I'm actually going to put this little timer on while you sit quietly for two minutes. And when it, uh, when it ends, we'll take a moment to share something in the chat. I was wondering how obnoxious that sound was going to be. I didn't vet that first. <laughs> okay, so what I'd like to do is um, try a chat waterfall if you haven't done that before, is just take a moment, whatever kind of came to you during those two minutes, whether it's a reflection or a wondering, um, go ahead and type it in the chat and uh, we'll hit send all together. You'll give it about 15 seconds and then we'll hit send and we're all ready. Oh, or you can send now. <laughs> Thank you, Micah. Send when you're ready, how about that? And then we have some time to share to, for question and answer after. I love that this is um, resonating with people in other disciplines. That's great. Thanks for that, Brian. Wonderful. I'm going to um, go ahead and stop sharing and I think open the floor. Um, Mike and Kim, I think you are going to do a better job of managing the questions or the comments. <laughs> There's a lot of love in the comments for, for what you shared and uh, excitement about using um, this model of inviting students story. I think it from what I'm seeing, I might be the only one who asked about any potential problems. Mm -hmm. so maybe I'll just throw that in there as it's part of our model of, of, of um, you know, thinking about pros and cons. I think, you know, it's, it's this um, uh, fabulous example you shared of, of you know, um, everybody shared that all the examples were really positive stories. And maybe it was because precisely because you gave the, um, 
the frame and the complete open-endedness to share your story exactly as you want. And I think sharing a positive story of, of, of joy and, and excitement is, is, is maybe the best way in for anybody, but I'm just curious if anybody ended up sharing in this first story, anything more difficult for them and how that went. Cause I think that's always a, a tension of this invitation to share your story in a, yeah. in a classroom. Absolutely. There were a couple um, last year that were really about depression and isolation um, to the to the point where I did reach out to, to counseling and students connected them with mental health. Um, I thought it was powerful that students felt um, comfortable to share how they felt um, and that there was lots and lots of encouragement from other students in the class in the comments, but it was definitely um, something that made me concerned and that I reached out to them, not in the way they told their story, but just in knowing that they that they were isolated and that they didn't need support. I'm wondering now also about this semester, I have a number of Afghani students and I have received messages over the last few weeks um, just about not being able to complete work um, and, and like, or just, you know, catching up with things, but with just devastating news of families back home. Um, and we haven't, you know, we're just now beginning this semester. So we haven't done our stories yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if something like that came up. Um, I, and the other thing that kind of happens sometimes is that the story will just be really superficial, right? Like someone like, okay, I came from here, I moved here, now I'm gonna be, you know, an accountant or what, it's not about being an accountant that's superficial, but just like it, they've like, that kind of more of a shallow story. So you have that whole range of, of what students share for sure. I, I just wanna flag your point uh, that maybe this is an initial story uh, I thought that was a really great point that, um, you know, I'm going to share myself how I feel like sharing at the moment, and then maybe I will feel now comfortable to go deeper uh, with others in public, which is what you're also asking for. Really interesting stuff. Um, Kim, did you want to have a follow up before we grab other questions from the chat? I just wanted to talk about the simplicity of the technology, because I feel like that was also a finding that we had in previous iterations of thinking about smart tech use is that it's not about the most, um, the, the technology with the bells and whistles, but accessibility is extremely important. And so that question of, um, you know, you chose Adobe Spark for a lot of reasons and you chose Padlet for a lot of reasons. And a lot of them were about easy access and I remember in some of the previous, um, our previous sessions talking about uh, broadband and bandwidth and mm -hmm. whether students could actually operate the programs. And so I just, I don't know. I don't know that I have a question. I just feel mm -hmm. like that is such a, an important um, consideration. And I think sometimes as educators, we get caught up in the, it'll be more robust if they have these other things they can do. Mm -hmm. And so moving, the robustness to their own stories instead and honoring what each student brings rather than saying that it's the technology that makes the difference. Mm -hmm. so it wasn't a question, Denise. I don't know. <laughs> you can. No, the, the, so I feel like I had to say it. I appreciate that. I think that is an important component when choosing when choosing tools because a lot of times we want students to have more options. Like students be like, I can't change the font on this one slide. I'm like, no, you can't good, like, thank goodness, now you don't have to worry about it, kind of, you know, um, but the more tech savvy students will ask about some of those options, but that's not the focus, right, the, the tool is not the focus. Um, I see Amy's comment here, maybe just because it's last, asking about um, building community among educators. It's so interesting. Um, I actually had asked, it, asked at some point for all of our, our ESOL faculty to, to make a story it's always harder to get fellow colleagues to do things than students. So some people did, and we tried them. Um, and then, and those were really amazing and wonderful. So I do think it's the same thing. It's a wonderful way to build community with each other um, as well. And I do think in, it depends on, you know, you kind of survey your, your students or your colleagues or what you're working on in terms of how much time you need to complete this project. Um, so in, in asking them how much, you know, if people have less time to dedicate if they're not in a class. Um, how, how could this project be handled? It, it would depend a little bit on 
tech savvy and and probably motivation <laughs> if we're honest i've seen these kind of share activities um more on paper actually but that were intended for youth to share be adapted for adults to share mm -hmm. and so i think that instinct is really great i think your your insight denise about the um the time to do it asynchronously is really something i want to keep thinking about because you know usually it's the icebreaker where as you said you have to share this thing like in the moment mm -hmm. um and so the time to think about it is really an important uh piece that i thought you brought let's see what else is here in the chat um i'm gonna the highlight um there's one that katie bell said here um, about giving students a sense of accomplishment of doing something creative they might not have known they could do. I have a funny story because there's one gentleman in my class who 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 like made his and shared it, and then we look back at the pattern. And there was like five more stories, and I'm like, uh, what, what's going on? <laughs> and he's like, No, I went skiing, and then we did this, and we just and he just like got so excited that he went back into his past photos and things and just started making stories. Um, to share with like his children and grandchildren that sense of empowerment and accomplishment for someone who just didn't think they'd be able to do that is really fun to see. It's also fun to see that show up in other disciplines and classes. So students will tell me later, oh, we had in history class an opportunity to do a project and we got to choose. Um, so I chose to do a story. Um, I'm always looking for projects that can go beyond just your one classroom. Any pushback from colleagues about this being worth the time it takes? Mm. Yes, I mean, there is always pushback um, in terms of building, just the general building community and welcoming and belongingness as um, coddling students and wasting time. And we know that the research um, fully, there's no question in the research that in order for students to feel like they are gonna be successful and that they're gonna be, um, you know, interested in learning and connected with the instructor and ready for the rigor that is demanded of them, that they must feel a sense of community and welcomeness and have an established relationship with the instructor and other students. There's no question on the research. Um, so I, I do hear that all the time. Um, and I just don't know what to <laughs> say because it's so clear to me. Um, and especially, especially clear in an online environment. It also seems, Denise, that um, in your content area, right, in teaching speakers of other languages, um, building confidence in teaching English, that it would be easy for you to support this kind of work, right? The oral yeah. language practice, the um, grammatical constructions, all of those things. Storytelling seems like a natural there. Mm -hmm. But then I wonder then if you're teaching in science, like somebody who's I know we have some science teachers out there. Yeah. Like, what would you say? Like, why would this be so critically important in your um, content area? Would be interesting to think about as well. Yeah. Besides Denise's fabulous research that we know is true, right? Students learn better when they feel connected and supported. You're welcome, Brian. Laura's um, shouting out that she's a science teacher. Um, you want to weigh in, Laura? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi. <laughs> yeah, I'm fast at the typing. Um, yeah, it's really, really we 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 talk a lot about community in our class as it is, and they're all future teachers. But um, to be able to say, uh, you know, it's really important that they learn to that being wrong we, we it's not really mistake making but to be wrong to th to think well maybe it's like this but it's not if we find out it's not is this is really important to learning and, and if you if i can help move them towards being willing to do that if they can move themselves really then they empower themselves so much because we a lot of people have really a a lot of hangups about being wrong in front of other people. And so knowing each other lets them um, and knowing, having, sharing their stories lets them be more comfortable. 
Sorry about the video. I was eating earlier, so. Oh, no worries. Hi. <laughs> and I see Amy's um, also commenting um, from a science teacher perspective that students, when they should collaborate in their learning first, and, and it's best to do this outside of the science context, right? So they're learning that collaboration, those skills. And then when you take it to science, then you can focus on the science because they're already established that. Yeah, I would also just to further explain what I was getting at is a lot of times kids have um, or adult learners have science anxiety. And so like if you start the collaboration in a place where they already have anxiety, um, it can make the collaboration mm -hmm. harder. So if you're building it in a place where they already have some competence and confidence, um, then I do feel like the collaboration skills transfer better. Yeah, that makes sense. I think I'm really still stuck on the the, the asynchronous uh -huh. Uh -huh of this in that um, last week or last time we all met, we were talking about um, whether the <clears throat> a certain strategies uh, for inviting student voice um, more, I think, via your fingers in, in real time um, on a Padlet and stuff were uh, fully supported for English learners and that the, uh, the time to go off and um, hone my presentation and practice it and delete ones I don't want and then share because it's going to live on a website kind of so mm -hmm. the time to put um, myself forward the way I want to mm -hmm. is just super interesting mm -hmm. and I think very different than than um, the typical idea of real time sharing of self there's something there's something really important about that yeah it's interesting because sometimes students will do a little reflection on it and students will say like oh, you know, it took me forever to record or whatever. And then I'll follow up like, oh, how come it took you so long? And, then, and they'll just say like, I recorded each sentence like 15 times, like until I really was happy um, with how I sounded, worked on my pronunciation, but just really wanted it to sound the way, the way they wanted to present their best foot forward, right? Which is different than an informal conversation. And I think both are important, obviously. Um, but then you sometimes, those same students that are recording multiple times and really nervous, those are the same ones that might not say anything or just very, very little in class because they're just not um, confident yet. They're in the, like the early stages of that um, mm -hmm. production mm -hmm. of language. Denise, this has been just fabulous. And, and I think there are four minutes left. So we want to kind of wrap up the... Mm -hmm session and invite people to the next one. Um, Kim, you want to talk through the first? Yes, we, we want to invite all of you to join us and continue this conversation in the Smart Tech Use for Equity Right Now Teacher Studio. If you go to that link, you'll find a space um, for, uh, for connection and for questions, for ideas, for sharing resources, for talking through any of these um, kinds of ideas that we've just hit the surface on here. So please encourage, I, I encourage you to go in there and I encourage you to interact. And we all promise to jump in if somebody poses a question or, or shares a resource. Great. I'm having trouble lifting on there the blank note taking page, which is um, just a basic scaffold for doing the kind of, um, let me see if I can do it. Can't seem to do it. No, oh, here we go. Maybe I, this will work. Um, to, uh, to do this kind of note taking yourself uh, on a tech use of your own, thinking about its pros and cons. Um, we will be with these recordings, putting them all on the school talking website that I have, and then also considering um, kind of lifting up, like I said at the beginning of, of key ahas out for folks who might not have time to watch multiple hours of stuff. Um, and then if you go to the last slide, Angela, um, fabulous, it, to invite you to our next session. Uh, our colleague Joe is gonna take on this issue of ahas uh, from, um, forced remote engagement and assessment. So bringing in this uh, this question of assessing student learning uh, and work that we haven't quite uh, gotten to in our series yet. So we're looking forward to building in that conversation with Joe next time. So that is on the 21st. We are really excited to hopefully see you there, invite your colleagues. Uh, you see, we are loving this small dialogue. So we're, we're happy if you come back, but invite a friend 
Um, and we'll continue to grow this dialogue about smart techies for equity. Thank everybody so much for uh, taking this time this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, as the fall uh, starts out and roars through. So thanks a million. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Kim. And thank you, everybody who came. We will see you next time. And thank you, Angela, for, as usual, keeping us on track. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.